Ladies and gentlemen, this is not Gotham Chess. Have you ever played an in-person chess game? Seems like a silly question, but it actually isn't. Most players these days learn online chess and mostly play that until they reach about 1800 maybe, and then they'll start playing some real over-the-board games. Maybe you played your grandparent or something in the past, but over-the-board games lead your opponent to be able to distract you. Whether it's kicking you under the table, or eating something at the board, apparently the worst is crisps, the pieces get all greasy. For me, I had an opponent in a tournament rip out a mozzarella sandwich and start eating it during the game, which was somewhat strange. And the same opponent, in fact, was actually eating entire plums, stones and all against my friends. So that's the story for another day. But in this game, Gary Kasparov, the former world champion in a game, was so annoyed and so wanted to beat his opponent that he played his move and slammed the clock so hard the pieces jumped off their squares. Let's just get into the game. So we see Gary Gaspar with the white pieces, opens with his usual d4. So d5 by Serawan. Knight to f3, both players getting their pieces out and controlling the center, not much to be said here. Yasser immediately strikes back, taking a little bit of a more unorthodox approach. But Gaspar knows what he's doing, captures, captures. And then we see Kasparov actually letting both these pawns be captured. Think, well, Serawan's up two pawns. Well, no, these pawns are not going to last. Kasparov actually takes with the queen first, avoiding the, uh, sorry, going head first into the queen trade, saying, I'm better in this endgame, I don't know what you're planning. Knight to b5, putting immediate pressure on that weak, weak c7 square, saying, all right, I don't know what you're doing. I'm going to win your rook. I'm going to smash you off the board. So I was like, uh, not so fast, but I'm going to go knight to a6, protecting the square, making sure there's no forks or anything. But this knight can be a bit awkward. Well, this knight, I would say, is pretty well placed. You know, sometimes you go knight to b5, it's not a well placed piece here. It definitely is controlling key squares and also limiting the movement of the king and that bad knight on a6. Kasparov throws e4, claiming the full center. Also saying, all right, Sarawan, I'm going to win your, my pawn back and you're going to have absolutely nothing. In fact, I'm going to have the advantage of this position. Sarawan says, okay, knight to f6, targeting the pawn on e4. You see f3 just completely solidifying the structure. Now, this is a very common idea in these sort of end games where you don't need a knight to go to f3. Just absolutely making your center ironclad with the pawn chain, every pawn protecting each other. And all you have to do is defend this pawn on g2, which you shouldn't have to do for a long time. Sarawan decides to trade, takes back and an e5 himself. Staking his own claim in the center, saying, all right, I need to munch on these two lovely squares. Just to sort of limit Sarawan's count, uh, sorry, Kasparov's counterplay a little bit. Gets the bishop out, and a bishop to b4 check. But no biggie, king just slides up. King e7 by Sarawan, and then Kasparov finally decides to recoup his pawn. Sarawan gets a rook in the game. Kasparov gets his rook in the game. No, he doesn't use this rook, because he doesn't want his rook on the a-file to get trapped. And Sarawan uses this rook to make sure this pawn on a7 is protected. All right, we're up to speed. Bishop c5. Ready to trade off. Rick HD1. Kasparov says, all right, I'm just going to get my last piece in the game. Look at Kasparov's position. Every single piece is in the game here. Same for Serwan, actually. Because this rook is doing an important job of defending that very weak a7 pawn. Captures, captures. And then knight to e8. And apparently during this game, I've heard this from Yasser Serwan himself, um, Kasparov was actually screwing his pieces into the board. So he lost to Yasser at the previous Olympiads. He was really wanting to win this. There's a lot of pressure on him from his uh, friends, colleagues, and the entire Soviet Union to beat the US in this match. So he was really wanting to win. And being the world champion, he had the ego and the skills to prove it. Bishop to b3 by Kasparov. Serwan takes on c1, captures back, and at f6, now he's got the same idea, just solidifying the structure in the center there. a3 by uh, Kasparov, just limiting the counterplay of this knight. This knight actually can't move anywhere apart from back to b8. Knight d6, trying to trade off even more. Bishop to d5, tightening that weak pawn. And basically the idea is if you take, which we do in fact see in the game, so I'll just play it out. Knight takes b5. He can take on b7 with a double attack on the knight and the rook. And you can only save one of these pieces. So knight b to c7 is played. And Kasparov here actually doesn't decide to take the knight. He decides to take the rook. Uh, leading into this end game where he's got a rook and then Yasser has these two knights. So you might think, wait, what's he doing? He's complete blunders of advantage away. What's going on here? Well, the fact is... This rook is going to be a strong piece always. Rooks in the endgame are always very strong pieces, and these knights are not well coordinated at all. Basically, the knights are not long range pieces. The game is going to be played on two sides the queen side and the king side, and the rook is going to be able to navigate that change much faster than these knights can. So that's where Kasparov's advantage kind of lies here. Plus, these knights aren't very well placed. They're not very in the game right now, and they're not very well coordinated. It's very hard to coordinate two knights, especially against a rook. So, rook to c8 immediately infiltrating the back rank. Sarawan decides to bring his knight back in the game, and then Kasparov starts harassing these pawns a little bit. Of course, the king moves over, the rook moves over, and then Sarawan hangs his pawn on h7, but it's not really hanging. If you want to capture that, he's going to play king to g8, and your rook is going to be extremely passive for the rest of the game on the h-file. You're going to have to spend moves to break your rook out of jail, basically. So he decides to go uh, rook to b8, sliding that rook over onto the b-file, and apparently after this move, he was screwing all the pieces in, and after this move, he slammed the clock so hard that all the pieces jumped off the squares, even the board next to them, which Karpov was playing on, 
some of their pieces left their squares. And actually, during, after this move, uh, Sarawan had four minutes on his clock and started doing his fists up like, Gaspar, if you want to fight, like, he was so annoyed. Sarawan, if you know him or seen his videos, he's one of the chillest people in the chess scene. So, you know, if he wants to fight you, you really messed up. And Gaspar would immediately start apologizing, saying, no, no, sorry, Yasser, sorry. I didn't mean to make you this annoyed. So things sort of calmed down. But Yasser, he's a very calm person. He was rattled by this. And we can see that in his play a little bit. King T7, a good move. Sarawan's also trying to play for a win in time travel, which we do see, but great move from Gaspar here, B4. Taking the sting out of all this sort of knight C4 check nonsense. Basically, the idea is after you move the king, you can't grab this pawn because your knight will hang. So let's say the king moves. You can't grab the pawn. The knight's just going to hang. So it's, Sarawan has to find something else. He goes knight back to D7, basically getting his knight um, away from the pawn attack. Rook G8, again, attacking these pawns on the king's side. G5. Uh, sorry, Sarawan says, none of that. You're not attacking my kingside pawns. That's not happening. A4. These pawns are going to be marching up. What are you going to do about it? Takes, takes. Rook comes back. That pawn's going to be marching up the board. Got to stop that quickly. A5. King comes in. G3, solidifying the queen side. H5, doesn't matter. H4, shut that down immediately. Captures, captures, and knight moves into C5. Doesn't matter. I'm going to keep pushing the pawn. I'm still pushing the pawn. Knight to B7. And this was a blunder. A massive mistake. See, we can see the... Crown here, that means black resigned in this position. If you want to find the tactic that wins the game on the spot, I'll give you a few seconds while I take a drink of my water like Agad Mater. Congratulations if you're able to find the move. Not the craziest tactic under the sun, but rook to c8 check. If you move the king, why would you do that? If you take the rook, I queen with check, and this queen is not going to struggle to beat these two knights. This is like a spot I've won the game. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. Don't forget to subscribe. We're extremely close to 1,000 subscribers. I mean a lot to me and be good for the community. Uh, leave a comment as well what games you may want to see next. And hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one.